Good evening. It is my great privilege this evening to present the 2012 Hillman Prize for Magazine Journalism to Sarah Stillman, who wrote an amazing, shocking piece called The Invisible Army for the New Yorker. On US military bases in war zones, Fijian beauticians buff nails, Kenyan truckers deliver frozen steaks, and Nepalese restaurant workers scoop ice cream. They are part of the Pentagon's invisible army, the 70,000 service workers who support American troops on military bases in Iraq and Afghanistan. They are recruited from some of the world's poorest countries, and their death toll equals and may even surpass or exceed that of US military personnel. This is a great story for any journalist, an important story, a story about basic fairness and human rights for working people. And Sarah Stillman told it absolutely beautifully. Reporting for The New Yorker, who deserves an enormous amount of credit for running this piece, Sarah interviewed hundreds of workers in both countries. She reported on wage theft, sexual assault, uncompensated injuries, and conditions resembling indentured servitude. Some like the Fijian beautician she met at Camp Anaconda in 2007, signed up for work in Dubai for lavish wages, only to be shipped off to Iraq and paid a fraction of what they were promised. Sarah's reporting cast an important spotlight on a major, major human rights story. And it is leading to real policy change. The End Trafficking in Government Contracting Act is a vital bipartisan legislation introduced in both the House and Senate this spring. Sarah is a visiting scholar at NYU's Arthur L. Carter Journalism School and a Knight Loose Fellow for reporting on global religion. She is active in the global social, social justice movement, and her work is in the finest tradition of the Sidney Hillman in his cause of a better America. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in congratulating Sarah Stillman for the 2012 Sidney Hillman Prize in Magazine Journalism. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, Thank you to the foundation and to the judges especially, um, all of whom I've been in awe of for a very long time. Um, and it's a real gift to be here in the presence of so many journalists I admire and activists I admire who are um, engaged in you know, what we've been talking about as a, as a war. Um, and, and thanks also to the legacy of Sidney Hillman um, because this really is a story about um, migrant workers and their struggle. And, it began uh, when I was at an Indian restaurant in Oxford, England, a few years ago, oddly enough, and I had a waiter, um, a young man, Tony, who came up to me. He was, he was giving me dinner, and he heard my American accent, and he said, oh, you're an American. I, I used to work on a US military base um, feeding soldiers. And he whipped out his cell phone, and he started showing me these pictures of him with uh, Jessica Simpson on her USO tour in a little like tank top. <laughs> Um, and you know, he had these very funny and interesting stories, but then he began to tell me about some of his friends, also from Goa, India, um, who had been promised great jobs in Dubai um, and Jordan, and instead were taken to a war zone, to a US military base uh, to serve workers' food. And you know, other workers who had been hit by rockets and who had lost eyes or limbs and just been sent home to their countries with no insurance entitlements. Um, so this was on my radar when I first went to Iraq in 2008. And um, I, I thought I was going to have to work hard to dig up these stories and, and just find these people. Um, and I arrived on the base. And lo and behold, one of the first things I saw was a Burger King uh, staffed by Indian workers. Um, and one of the second things I saw was a Pizza Hut staffed by Bangladeshis um, and a Cinnabon, and then a beauty salon um, where you could actually get $7 pedicures or manicures from uh, a group of Fijian women who ultimately became the subjects of my story. Um, basically, from the moment I entered the salon and began talking to them about how they found themselves in Iraq, 
I learned that they had been promised um, to lavish jobs in a nice uh, hotel in Dubai and instead were taken to Iraq um, where you know, I got to know them over a period of years and um, uh, was there on the day that one was sexually assaulted by her supervisor. Um, and when I called the emergency sexual assault hotline on their behalf, I found only a phone that rang and rang and no answer over a period of several days. Um, I wish I had time to go into more of what the workers faced, but just to give one example of um, how they stood up for themselves, I found that uh, on the largest U.S. military base in Baghdad, 1,600 workers rioted because they were being uh, essentially starved, not getting enough food on a routine basis. Um, so I was stunned by this, and I got back to the U.S., and I started um, getting ready to pitch the story to editors, and the first editor I went to uh, handed me back the pitch and said, you know, if you could tell me in the Hollywood movie version of the story, who would Julia Roberts play, then I might consider it. So at this point, I call my dad, who <laughs> was, like, was my source of strength through this, and he says, you got to keep going. So ultimately, I found um, an editor who was willing to take a chance on me, Henry Finder at The New Yorker, to whom I'm eternally grateful. Um, so I want to say thanks to, to him and to the magazine. Um, and... Um, also, most of all, thanks to the workers who risked so much to speak to me, who would sneak off to bunkers or to bathrooms and um, often put their, their jobs um, really on the line. I, I remember one who I, I write about in the piece, Imatiya Sharif um, from Sri Lanka, who told me, you know, I really believe that if American people knew what was happening, they would do something. So I hope, you know, this evening is a, is a testament to that and to all the work that the others in the room are doing. Thank you. Thank you.